Hola amigos, welcome to the first video in this new tutorial series. Before we begin, I have a few disclaimers to make. The first one is that this is not going to be about Unreal Engine, as you might have guessed already from this UI and from the title of the video. But don't worry, I'm still going to be releasing Unreal tutorials and that's still going to be my primary focus. The second one is that I'm recording this on the fly. I have some notes next to me, but no script, so we'll see how that goes. And next, I know that Houdini is expensive and complicated, but everything that I'm gonna show can be done with the free version of the software, which I will talk about in a moment, and by the end of this series you should be able to make renders like this with no problem. So, what is Houdini exactly? Well, if you are into visual effects or game development, you might have heard about the software, but you might not know what's special about it. Well, Houdini is a 3D animation software or package, just like Maya, Max, or Blender, or ZBrush. The main difference with those is that it uses procedural generation instead of more traditional modeling techniques. So, for example, in ZBrush or Maya, you usually think of solids so as something like clay or similar, and you sculpt that clay using an assortment of tools and modifiers. A lot, of the, a lot of times, those modifiers are destructive, which means that once you take a few steps, it's hard to redo the previous one without affecting everything else. In Houdini instead, we think of solids as a collection of data, like points, edges, vertices, etc., and then we modify this data in non-destructive ways, by keeping all the operations in a stack so we can go back to any of them. Let me show you here for a moment. If I go to any of these objects, for example this cylinder here, this group of nodes here are all the operations that I did on this, on this cylinder. And I can go back, for example, to this bevel and change the parameters here and the rest of the stack keeps unmodified. Now, this is extremely useful to do things like simulations or for fluids or destruction physics or cloth, for example, and also to make some types of geometry like trees and rocks and other organic looking objects. So Houdini has also some regular modeling tools, like I can move vertices around, but those tools are not very good and I don't think anyone uses them. So why to use this instead of Maya? Well, in the movie industry it's used professionally all the time for visual effects and almost every big scene that has explosions or water or smoke and so on these days is simulated in Houdini and then rendered in other software. And you might be saying, well, cool, but I'm making a game for Nintendo Switch, so there's no way this software is useful to me, is it? And the answer is, no, there is. And absolutely, many studios use it. And the, the obvious case scenario is for cinematics, but those are like movies, so let's ignore them. But in addition to that, I already mentioned trees and rocks, but also things like natural scattering or fur or hair. And also you can use it to bake the extraction or particle effects that would be too complex to simulate in real time and export them already baked. For more specific examples, the city from the Matrix demo was generated in Houdini and then exported to Unreal using the Houdini plugin. And more, even more recently, in the 5.2 Unreal presentation, they use Houdini Vellum to simulate cloth and muscle deformation. So let's see how to install it. If you open a browser and go to and search for Houdini Apprentice, the first result should be the SideFX website. Let's go to it, and from here you can download the launcher. The launcher allows you to install any of the free any of the versions of Houdini, like Indie, Professional, or Apprentice. The Apprentice version, which is free only has a few limitations, like you cannot use it for commercial projects, the maximum rendering resolution is limited, and some of the export options for saving to other formats are not allowed. Good news is that if you plan to use it for Unreal, you can still download the FBX export node from the, the SideFX GitHub. I'll talk about that in a future video. Now, let's say you download the launcher, install Houdini, 
the apprentice version and start it and the first thing that you see is something like this and I must admit it there's a lot there is multiple panels each one with several tabs there is like a ton of icons here at the top each one of these tabs has many many icons some of those tabs don't even like fit all the icons in one row so there's a lot and I agree but trust me it's not that complicated let's see all the pieces of the main UI that we will care about at least for a couple tutorials let's start with the top row of icons I'm not going to discuss all of them individually because there's a ton and because I don't know what many of them do the important part is that they are basically macros or shortcuts for functions that you can still do here manually but with a few more clicks let's see with an example if we go to the create tab on this left row and click on box and then anywhere in the viewport a few things are going to happen first we have a box but here we have a bunch of parameters and here we have a node of the type geometry called box object one which is this geometry here now on the viewport we have many icons and a few more here on the top row let's start with this column here these are basically tools that we can use to modify the object here in the viewport we can ignore these first three icons for now and move to the fourth one which is the select tool now you might have noticed that when I click on it these icons change these are basically options that change how this tool works in the case of the select mode we can change between box um, lasso uh, or brush we can also include or not visible objects objects that are only partially included in the in the selection etc okay let me select back this and next we have the transform tools which are uh, move rotate and scale and they work exactly the same as you would expect from any other engine next we have the pose tool which is useful for characters but also any other object that uses bones and here we have the handle tool now the handle tool is specific for each node and will change dynamically based on what node is selected next we have a snapping options to snap to the grid to snap to curves or to points etc and we can hold any of these icons and we'll show more options about it now, let's disable that and the next one is the view mode the view mode when you're in the view mode you can rotate the camera with the left mouse button pan with the middle mouse button and zoom in and out with either the right mouse button or the scroll wheel and note that um, rotate like this or zoom are relative to where the mouse is clicked and if you lose track of your object you can select the node and when view mode is selected press F on the keyboard to center the object on the to center the camera on the selection and when you're in a different tool for example let's say we're in select mode and we want to move the camera we can hold the alt key and temporarily enable view mode then move the camera around and when we release the key it will go back to the previous tool now this column on the right are basically options to toggle the display or not or certain pyre or certain details of the geometry like we can toggle display of points point normals point trails which are basically movement or computed velocities point IDs and then faces face normals face numbers etc let me disable all of this for now and here we have the parameters view which works exactly as you would expect and is the same as any other 3d editor one feature that I like to comment on which is exclusive to Houdini and I haven't seen elsewhere is that you can on any of these numeric panels you can hold the middle mouse button and it will display this strip with a scale now when any of this is selected if you move the mouse left or right it will change the value by that amount you can also do that on the name 
and it will change all the parameters at the same time. Now, the bottom here is the network view, and that's where most of the magic happens. Now, we have a geometry node, and if we roll over it, we have a few icons, and here we have a few color sections that match those. Now, all of those can be toggled either clicking on the icon or on the section itself. It produces the same result. Now, the green one allows us to make the object selectable or not. Now, with the, with the green arrow deselected, now we cannot click on this. The eye opens the information panel. And for this object, let's expand this a little bit. We have a few properties here, like the display render, and constraints, and transform order, etc. We can also open this panel if we hold the middle mouse button on a node. And here on the right we have the display button. If we toggle it on, a, on, on and off, the object will be or not rendered here. Now, this is an objects network. Now, think of it as the networks or as the graph nodes in Unreal. We have a set of nodes for the material graph, and we have a completely different set of nodes for a blueprint graph. And some of those are similar, like there's a plus or minus or subtract on both of those, but they perform, they use different code. Here is very similar. We are in an objects network, and if we right click or press tab on this network, we can see all the nodes here organized into tabs, and if we go to the bottom, we have an all category that has all the nodes. And it looks like there's a few, but it's not that many. So let's remove this box and add our own geometry node. So again, press tab or right click, and instead of searching for it, for it just start typing geometry. And here it is, we can click, and then click again, and then we have this geo node. And it doesn't have a cube because it's completely empty. Now, we can double-click on it, and it will go inside this node. Now, we are now in a geometry context, and here we can create geometry. Now, if we press right-click or tab, and we can see that we already have a few more categories. And if we go to the all, don't be scared, but there is a lot of them. And if we scroll, there is even more, and it looks like it doesn't stop. And it looks like there is a lot, but you don't have to memorize all of this. A lot of these nodes have different aliases, and many have names that make sense. And also the search button is quite, intu quite intuitive and quite smart, and will search for parts of the text. So, for example, let's start by, if we wanted to add a box, we can type box, or we could type cube. And let's see, oh, it also has, adds a box. So this, this is a cube is basically an alias for a box. So let's remove this one and this one and add a different node. And let's start creating something. Let's start with some text. So if we type font and place one of those here and then zoom out a little bit, you see the whole thing. Now we can see a text that says frame colon one. And here in the text properties, it says, it doesn't say frame colon one, it says frame and then dollar sign F. And this is a very cool aspect of Houdini, which is that data centric approach. Like everything is data that we can treat as variables, as, as code if we want, including this text. But I know that programming is scary, so let's forget a bit about that for now and just change this for a simple hello or hello world. And now we have our text here. Now I'm okay with the size and the font, which we can change here, uh, the font, and then the scale we can change either the, on one axis or we can change them uniformly. And But I'm okay with that. What I want to change is I want the text to be sitting on the grid. So I'm going to change the vertical alignment from middle to bottom. And now it is, there is our hello text. And the back faces of an object are usually shaded a little bit darker. So we know this is the front. 
Now, before moving on, I want to change a little bit my layout for something that I'm more comfortable with. So I'm going to get rid of all these tabs. I don't care about performance monitor or the take list, but I want my parameters. But instead of adding it and have to switch between both, I'm going to just click on the network and press P on the keyboard. And this will open a floating parameters view for the node that is selected. That gives you a lot of more like real estate to place nodes. Now, let's give this text a little bit of depth. And for that, we can start dragging from the node or we can right click on uh, or tab and then connect it. And let's search for extrude. And as I was saying, it's kind of smart and it doesn't, it includes this poly extrude in the results, which is the one that we want. So we can add it and then connect it to the output of the font. Now, we don't see anything for a couple of reasons. The first one is that we are still displaying this font. Now, if you remember from the previous node, this blue uh, section here with the eye means that this is the object or the node that is rendered. Now, we want to render the poly extrude, so let's go here and select the blue one. And now it's a good time to notice that there's a few more icons in this type of network. The first one here, this yellow down arrow, allows us to ignore or bypass this node. If we click on it, now there's nothing to extrude, so there's nothing here. Let's restore that. And next we have the same information icon, but now it shows information in a slightly different way. Now it shows the number of points, primitives, vertices, and polygons. And then we can see, which is it will be useful later that we have one attribute for each point called P and that stands for position. Now we can close this and next we have the freeze or lock which allows us to lock the parameters and don't allow them to be modified until we unlock this and here we have the display and the template. The template is an interesting option that you can almost think of it as a second display thing or a ghost version of it. So we can have an object with the blue section on and another object with the pink section on. For example, let's say we add a box here and well, I want to make, let's say I want to make this box the same size as this hello. It's hard to do if I have to keep switching and kind of eyeball it. So instead what I can do is select the box and then click on the template for the poly extrude and now we have both on the viewport. Now let's remove the box and disable this here and go back to displaying the poly extrude and let's give this a an actual depth. We do that by increasing the distance parameter which starts at zero. We can also extrude it in the opposite direction but let's make it a little bit bigger. And here I can show you also how the handle manipulator works. So with the poly extrude selected, if I select this handle tool, now we have this red line here, which allows us to extrude this visually on the viewport. For this case, I want to be precise. So I'll go back to here and select the 0 0.5. And I think I'm going to give it some divisions in this axis. So I'm going to increase this to, let's say, 8 or 10. Okay, now one thing that I just noticed is that our object doesn't have a back face. So we can fix that if we look here at the poly extrude options. One of these options is, uh, or one of these groups is for what to export or what to output. And we have selected output the front, output the side, and you can see that we have indeed sides and front, but we don't have a back. Just click on it and there it is, now we have our box. And let's say we want to add a little bit of detail and bevel the front a little bit to create a little bit of a chamfer or a curved bevel here. Well, let's try bevel. And here we have a poly bevel. So let's add one of those. And then we have an error because nothing is connected to it. So let's fix that and then select it. And again, nothing happens because still all the parameters are zero so let's zoom in a little bit and change the distance to 
I don't know, whatever. Let's increase it a little bit. 0 0.02 to 5. And this is cool, but it kind of rounded the whole thing. And I just wanted the bevel to be in the front. And it's kind of everywhere. So how can do we fix that? Well, if we go to the poly extrude, next to these outputs, we have this second checkbox that says front group, back group, and side group. And this is basically going to allow us to assign each of these faces, or each of these groups of faces, to a group. So let's enable both of these, and to see better what I meant by all of these, click here on the geometry spreadsheet. This has the data view of whatever node it's selected. So here we're looking at points, but we want to look at the faces. So we go to the third button, button here, which is primitives. And now we see that we have two properties for these primitives. One is called group extrude back, and the other is called group extrude front. And if we sort this out by one or the other, you can see that we have five primitives that belong to this group, and then another five primitives that belong to that group, which actually matches this because we have five letters. Cool, now we have our groups. Now, how do we use that? Well, we can go back to the poly bevel, and here at the top we have group. And this is basically asking us, hey, where do you want to apply this bevel? Which groups? So we can select the front, and now, as we can see, our bevel is just applied here on the front face. And now, let's say we also want it on the back. Well, we don't have to create a second poly bevel because these groups are additive. So if we just go here and select the second group, now you can see that it says extrude front, space, extrude back. Oh, perfect. And now we have both sides extrude, uh, beveled. We can also go here and let's increase the number of divisions. Like, I don't know, let's do three or four. And this has this curve. We can also change it to an actual chamfer or crease or make it solid, which doesn't change anything. But let's keep it stay on round. And OK, you might be saying this is pretty cool, but I can do this in Maya in a minute and a half. So what's the point? And you're kind of right. So let's make something that is kind of unique to Houdini and difficult to make in other software. So let's go back to the object level. And before anything else, let's save this. Uh, Houdini, I'm going to make a new folder, tutorial one. And then I'm going to call this hello world. And there it is. OK, this time we're going to use one of these icons at the top. Let's, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's do viscous fluid. And then click on the first one called melt object. Now, if you don't have anything selected, it, was, it will ask you select object to melt. And then press enter to complete. If you have your node selected, it will skip that process, that step. So we can select our hello text and press enter. And again, a few things are going to happen. First of all, we are in a different node network and we don't know where we are. And now our object is a bunch of particles, but it's just a few. So what is happening here? First, let's press play and see if we can figure it out. Well, first, our object is falling down the void and Second, this, this time bar is going crazy. So the reason for this last thing is that this is playing as fast as your CPU and GPU allow. If we want to play in real time, however, we can click this icon here, the little clock, and then it will play at whatever frame rate is set. OK, this is the really cool, but it doesn't explain the object still falling and what happened here. So let's start with this node network. This is the auto dub network. Let's go back to the object level and see what happened here. OK, we have our geo here. Let's change this name to hello 
text. And we can go back inside and say that, yeah, indeed, this is our font. Next, we have this green auto DOP network, and then we have Geo1 Fluid. Well, the auto DOP network stands for Auto Dynamic Operations Network. And here's where this simulation of melt happens. If we go inside, the first thing that I want to bring attention to is that this there's a little bug and this by default is placed in a couple of nodes overlapping. So we can just move things out of the way and organize things a little better. So I'm not going to go into the details of how everything here works, but here's what's happening in a nutshell. Here we have our flip fluid object, which is these particles, and these particles are basically loading this hello text. Next we have a gas temperature update, which we'll talk about that later, but we said melt, so it makes sense that there's some kind of temperature related node. Then merge, no, it doesn't do anything, just merges this with nothing else. And then we have a, a flip solver. And if we zoom in, we see that this has a little brain. And this is what is actually simulating these particles. Next, we have a merge. Again, it's not merging anything. And then gravity and then output. So let's fix these uh, particles falling down the wall. And we can do it very easily since we're using an auto network. So if we go to the second tab here on collisions, and click on ground plane, it will go back first to this node, or so, sorry, to this level, but if we go back to the node, uh, the DOP network, we can see that now we have a ground plane, another merge, and then another of these brain solvers for static objects. Now we don't want the ground to go away or do anything, so a static solver is perfect for that. Now if we press play again, now the object melts, but it's still very low resolution, so it's hard to see that there was indeed some, some text here. Okay, let's change that by going to our flip fluid object and increasing the resolution by reducing the particle separation. So now there's zero point units between each of these points. Let's change that to just for to show one moment, I'll change it to 0 0.01. Now, this is pretty good. I still could add more detail, but this would be not too bad. Problem is, this is not going to simulate anywhere close to real time. And for this video, I want to keep things a bit more fluid. No pun intended. So I'm going to change this to, I don't know, 0 0.03, maybe. Uh, let's see how it does with 2. Okay, it's still not too bad. So, okay, our object is melting, and you might have noticed that the second time that I play, it goes faster. So the reason is, this blue bar here on the timeline is the part that has been already simulated, and it's cached into the memory. So if I keep playing, it will keep filling this with a blue bar, and if my timeline was super long, eventually this blue bar is, would start being cut from the beginning. Now, within this blue section, I can scroll back and forth as fast as I want, and it usually performs quite well. Now, if I change any of the parameters here that affect the simulation, for example, let's say we want to make this object cool slower, we can go here to the gas temperature update and increase the cooling rate. Let's say instead of 0 0.25, let, we want 3. And these are chains, but also the bar now is orange. Orange means that, well, we can still use a scroll, but it's scrolling through bad data. It's data that doesn't match the current state of the simulation. To fix that, we can rewind and then press play again. And now the object is sagging a little bit. We can still see a little bit of the red hot parts of the object, but it's kind of staying there. That's pretty cool. Let's change this back to, I don't know, 2. 
who and you might have noticed these red parts in the middle that's because i didn't change the inner cooling rate if i change this to let's say change this one back to 0 0.25 and this one to one you can see that now our object is starting to cool first from the inside and then from the outside and that gives us a slightly different saggy look this is pretty cool and we can also change how much the object flows when the temperature changes this is done here in this part of the node where it says map temperature to viscosity we can change these values to change how the temperature changes and we can either use a linear um, ramp or we can even make our own curve now we don't want to see just the particles so we can go back to the object and actually if you notice we are not even looking at the DOP network it's not even selected to render what we are rendering is actually this geo1 fluid here so if we go here again there's a bunch of nodes I'm not going to explain all of them but let me reorganize this a little bit and we can see that the one that we are actually seeing is just this DOP import this is actually taking the information from here and just put it here now we don't want uh, the particles so let's see what we can do about that well we have here this particle fluid surface so if we select this one and enable the display here after a moment your object should be rendered as a solid and this is completely dependent on the separation that we said earlier on the particle simulation and I mean that literally so this has its own parameter but you can see that it's on a green box so that means that this parameter is set somewhere else now to see exactly how we can click on the name and it will change from the numeric current value to the actual formula or code so don't worry too much about this and the format of this address but it's basically similar to a navigation bar in a hard drive so we are in this node so dot dot will go to the previous level which in this case is this network then dot dot again which go back to the object level and then from there is selecting the auto DOP network and then from there is selecting the last output now let's go back here and ignore this for now but just think about it and it's important to realize that all of these parameters can be linked to other parameters set with formulas set with code and everything is extremely extremely flexible now we don't I'm okay with this resolution for this demo but I want to change the color I like the temperature view that we had with when we were using particles but it's not here cool thing is again all the data is here so it's just a matter of how we use it so here if we select this particle fluid surface we see that this option that is checked in uh, check out it says CD V UV and temperature these are the four parameters that are actually copied from the particle system and pass over to the next node and if we go back here to this spreadsheet for a moment we can see that in the points section we have indeed a parameter called temperature and right now at the beginning of the simulation it's 0 0.5 and as the simulation plays this number goes down as things cool off okay cool so let's go back to the same view and change the use this as a color so for that let's look for color and yes we have a color node here let's add one of those and we don't have to actually reconnect this manually here the, uh, remove this connection and redo this one here we can just drag the node inside and you can see that when you're close it actually connects itself so now we are adding a color node but we need to render it so let's enable the display on that and you can see that nothing happens as usual so if we select the node we can change actually how what it's doing and right now it's not mapping anything to anything so that's why we still have a white color so let's say we have we want to select the temperature 
so we can go to color type and instead of constant which we could change to I don't know a bright pink if we want we could change the color type to be a ramp from attribute now the attribute that we want is the temperature which appears here in the Dropbox so we can select it and now we have our temperature gradient that goes from black to white but that's kind of boring so we can either create our, ramp, our own ramp by changing these colors and manually doing something more, I don't know, more festive like this and then see how the object changes and goes from one to the other or we can use one of the presets if we click on the gear we have a bunch of presets let's do black to orange now let's do black body yeah okay so now we play it again our hello text melts and then turns red and eventually turns black as it cools off And now that the simulation is cached, I can play it again and it will play a little bit faster. Let's finish this little project by adding another layer of simulation. I think we can add some collision that will squeeze the object around. Let's see, we can add a sphere and then place it somewhere and then move it around until it's somewhere around yeah like on top of the object yeah like here maybe or something like that yeah so if we press play obviously the sphere is still not part of the simulation so nothing happens even if it was here nothing would be colliding with it yet to do that we need to transform it into a rigid body object since we have an auto dynamic network the easiest way to do it is just select the sphere object go to the rigid bodies tab and click on rbd objects now it looks like nothing happened but that's not really true if we go to the auto dock network we can see that there's a few more nodes here making another mess let's clear this up and reorganize things a little bit Okay, so we have a sphere object, which is importing this, then another merge, and a rigid body solver. This is the one that is simulating the collision of the object. So, to recap, we have our flip fluid object, which is the hello text, which is simulated by the flip solver. Next, we have the ground plane, our static object, that is not moving, but is colliding with the scene, and here it's handled by the static solver. And finally, our sphere object, which is simulated by the rigid body solver. So now let's rewind, press play again, and see what happens. Cool. The sphere is colliding, it's making a nice little dent, but I want it to roll around, so let's give it a little um, initial velocity. We can do that by going to the sphere object and on the initial state, let's give some velocity on the x axis. Let's say uh, maybe two, that might be too much. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's okay. So now the ball is pushing the thing around, and as this cools that down, the ball has more trouble pushing it, so it kind of slows down. that's pretty neat with this viscosity it's almost like it's paint or something like that so let's see it's simulated but if we play it it's not really going in real time now the reason is because we have a ton of particles here and the GPU is also doing the simulation or sorry the remeshing of the particles into this blob and that is costing a lot so the simulation helps, or the cache for the simulation helps, but it's not really making it, uh, it easy to appreciate the speed of the simulation.
To do that, we can just reframe this a little bit on the view, let's say something like that. So we can see how it moves around and then go to the object level and click on this icon here. This is the render flipbook icon. The first time that you click it, it will open this dialog, which allows you to specify some options and importantly, change the range that we want to render. In this case, let's say one, two, yeah, 120 is okay. And then once you set these numbers, we can click on start. And after a moment, this was still rendering, but it's rendering just the, the viewport. So it's pretty fast. And it will it simulate until the 120 mark. There's a few more frames and the ball goes away. Perfect. Now we can play it at real time. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this first tutorial and this video made Houdini a bit less scary for you. And let me know in the comments if it made you give this cool software a try. See you next time!